Here we go. So I'm really excited to speak this morning. Um, you know, when it's still weird to be called a pastor, you know, I'm still transitioning into that and really owning it. And thank goodness for worship and Terry and the, the whole worship team. Just that, those lyrics that say, you crown me with confidence. You crown me with confidence. And I'm grateful to get to speak this morning, but can I just say, thank you, Pastor, for not scheduling me next week, because I don't have to preach twice. <laughs> Once is enough for me. <laughs> That's cool with me. I'm fine with it. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. I do have a lot to share. I'm going to try to not go too fast and hopefully give my heart. You know, the fun thing about being new to preaching and kind of delivering and anyone when you have someone new preaches. Now, I don't want to come with my agenda, right? Like, I think sometimes that's a fear of new speakers. It's like, oh, they're going to come with their agenda. But I'm coming with messages that have been stewing in my heart for years, not just minutes, not just days. These are things that I've been thinking about and praying about and working through. And so you're going to see a little bit of a heart, my heart today, and some pain I had in my past, um, and some things in my faith that God grew me in, and I hope can really bless the church, because I think this is an important message to talk about. Uh, today's message is called, Glow Up Your Relationship with an Imperfect Church. I think... Frequently, you know, the glow up, right? The glow up in our life is that individual glow up, your grow up. Uh, we've, the past two weeks, we've heard the phrase, you have to grow up to glow up in your personal life. And I think sometimes when we have that as a new Christian, you know, we, we blossom immediately. There's this immediate sprouting that God watered something in your soul and you really come to life. And then maybe there's a moment where you look around and you you struggle because you see a church, you're like, wait, well, yeah, they're, they're not doing what they said Jesus is supposed to do, what I'm supposed to do. And it sometimes can stop that glow up. And so I want to start our scripture kind of of the series is 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17 says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is, in a new, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If the old has passed away, why do we sometimes see that old again in the church? We, ob we definitely see it in ourselves, but... Do we have grace for the church that continues to sometimes be imperfect? Wow. We've addressed life change in you the past two weeks, but, you know, I think about, we were talking about glow up or grow up, but when I came here, I moved here, I'm originally from Kansas City, Missouri, and I moved here 12 years ago. Shh, you're not preaching. Uh, and... <laughs> Probably one of my favorite things about moving to Louisiana, besides the food, was I, w I remember visiting LSU and it was the oak trees. I loved seeing the oak trees. Um, and just how big and grand, hundreds of years old and amazing that we preserved them and now we've just torn them all down. But, and I know this is an analogy, but it's just so good that you've heard before, but the root system of an oak tree is just as magnificent, if not more magnificent, than the tree you see above the ground. It's so strong that it destroys the roads as it comes back up. Like, it is damaging, it is strong, but it is rooted and it is immovable, and it's, they have endured how many hurricanes? Look at an oak tree. Think how many storms that tree has endured. And so... I want to dive into Psalm 92, 12 through 13. It says, The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They are planted in the house of the Lord and they flourish in the courts of our God. How long have you been planted in the church? And I mean really planted. Have you been to a church where maybe there was a scandal or there was a problem? Were your roots deep enough to not be uprooted immediately? These are pains that I don't want to admit are realities. 
I want to pretend, oh, we are perfect. Look, everybody looks so good today. <laughs> everybody, and that's how we, we come to church. We dress nice. We don't talk about our real lives. We don't, everything's perfect. And then the scandal drops and we're shocked. But the reality is the leadership and the people in your church are just as broken as you. We want to elevate them because they're supposed to be the intermediary between us and God, but they're not. Jesus is the only intermediary between you and God. We're trying to be faithful and we're doing our best, but there's only so much we can do. We're not, I love how Paul said it. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. So yes, find a church. Now that's important. I'm not giving, this is not permission to just like a church can do whatever they want, that they can abuse or they can do things. A church should still be pursuing Jesus and their heart should still be Jesus. But grace is such a hard thing when you're thinking about the imperfect church. It's when we see those flaws in hypocrisy though, that it's just so easy to, up, to uproot and that ends the glow up. Your glow up ends. That growth you had stops because you don't want a part of the body anymore, but Christ says, when detached from the body, the growth ends. And so maybe it's not your first time attempting to glow up in Christ. Maybe you've been here before. I think sometimes we think of glow up only for the new believer, the person who's just received Christ. But, but a lot of times, and if I'm honest with myself, the, the, the revival I see coming and that we're already seeing across the nation in Kentucky and elsewhere I think it's actually going to be a lot of people that they knew Jesus at one point in their life. But they're finding him again and they're trying to open up again. Do you have grace for that person? I think it's so easy to have grace for the non-believer. You go, I don't care. You look at a homeless person. You look to an addict. You look to someone. You say, I have grace for you. Jesus loves you. But then someone's a Christian and they fall into sin and it's judgment. All it is is judgment. We have no grace for that person. You're supposed to know Jesus. But people's, people come from pain. Pain is a motivator for all of us. And that includes leadership. And the, the people in your past, think of all the things that you do and mess up. Everyone is imperfect. Maybe you've heard this term deconstruction lately. Uh, it's kind of a hot Hot button topic. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to say it because deconstruction has been known. And depending on when I say that word, that could be like a trigger word for you. Depending on what you think of, a lot of people, when they hear deconstruction, they think of people who are losing their faith. They're people who are leaving God, leaving the church, maybe finding other ways for purpose. And I would challenge you that maybe that thought process, when someone says they're deconstructing, maybe we're attacking them or we're trying to defend the faith to them in a way that's, that has no grace because we know what it's meant for some people. And no, don't go down that path. But I challenge you to also think, let's break that down to even to what that says. Deconstruction is not destruction. Destruction is destroying. Deconstruction is tearing down walls back to a foundation. That is not wrong if that's all it is. Because if Jesus is our foundation, there are walls we build up in the church. And we know this because you look around, there's unbiblical and abiblical. Let me illustrate the difference. Unbiblical are the things that are against the word of God. We are going to stand on a foundation of Jesus in the word. And I'm going to preach a lot of scripture today. But abiblical are the things that are like, the Bible doesn't say yes or no about. It's just not in the Bible. Like what we're doing right now. The, the guitars and the keyboards and the, the seats and the way we do Sunday morning, do it on Saturday or you do it on Sunday or you, do, you have your holy day. Those are concepts that I think are abiblical. They're, they're, they're not wrong. They're not right either. They're just the way we are operating and the way we do things. Those are walls that we've built up. Well, sometimes man-made walls, we elevate to godly things. The way we do a thing, the way we preach a message becomes God, becomes scripture. A message, what I'm speaking, becomes on the same level as scripture. Maybe a worship song. Have you ever sat in a worship? I have. I've sat in a worship service and I'm like, I don't know about that line. Yeah. <laughs> I get a little thrown out of, like, of worship because I'm like, I love the song, but 
that one line. Worship songs are written by men and women who love God but aren't perfect. Sermons are preached by men and women who love God but aren't perfect. We are pursuing Jesus in a heart for him, but we're going to mess that up. And don't let that uproot you. You know, we live in a world of cancel culture, and, and you ever hear, like, cut the toxicity out of your life? Listen, if you have, if you have, if you have like, abuse, or you have something bad in your life, or a personality who's truly, maybe, maybe, you do. But do you pray on that? Do you go to God when you're going to completely cancel toxicity out of your life? Or is any imperfection toxicity? Anything? You're going to be 56 years old and have no friends. Because everybody's toxic a little bit. I am. So like what... How do we have grace? How do we do it? And I think I look at the, the people deconstructing, and I think deep down it comes from a pride that we, we know it all. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3 says, now regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols. That was the subject they were talking about. But listen to this next part. Yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue. I love the quotes there. We all have knowledge. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. I'm going to present knowledge this morning, but love is off this stage. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. You know, there's that scripture that says where we knock at the door and we said, Jesus, we, we did all these things for you. We, we did all of this stuff. And Jesus will say, get away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. That's one of the harshest scriptures, I think. I'm the type of person that really likes, like, just hit me straight. Don't, like, beat around the bush. Tell me the truth. And that scripture reminds me, know God. Know him intimately. You want to glow up? Learn things, yes, but know God. Be still and know him. Sit in the silence and listen to God. Do you do that ever? Or is it just Sunday morning preachers? Is that the only place that you get communion with God and the Holy Spirit? Because the scriptures are where God's speaking. This is me speaking. To get back, It's humility to say that our foundations haven't been built upon. It's, it's, I'm sorry, it's humility. We need to have humility. It's pride to think that our, that we haven't built foundations on things. You know, people rarely change their opinion after 30. I saw a poll and it said political opinions, whatever you believe in 30, like 90% of the people believe when they're 90, like People don't change their opinions on certain things. They never for a moment think, oh, maybe that's pride. Sit down for, I'm not saying you're wrong or it's wrong, but it's good to continually strip down, clothe yourselves in humility in the morning and ask, what don't I know? What don't I know? Your Bible study and knowledge should improve over the years as you glow up. And I really think for the, the deconstruction people, I think something's triggering something in them. And I don't think it's only the truth we're reje- they're rejecting. I think there's a pain there. Uh, and so my next big point, and this is the one I have in all caps, so write it down. You cannot let the failure of men derail your spiritual growth in Jesus. If a person can stop your glow up, then it will. They will stop it if you let that happen because people are going to let us down. There's a um, pretty prominent and controversial, quote unquote, clinical psychologist named Jordan Peterson. And he said in one of his podcasts, he said that the most vocal atheists and anti-theists, the people who are like, you've seen these people that, are, that rally against God and Christians and religion, that they were most likely hurt by the church at a young age. 
atheism for many is a reactionary thing. Their stance isn't really based on that they come, they, they present it as logic and some of it maybe is and they've thought it through, but the reality is, is that a lot of times they were hurt. But we debate them with this vitriol and this fists up when it should be open hands and grace that maybe what they need to see is that the church isn't hypocrisy, that it is love. It's the love that Jesus shared. Gandhi said that, I like your Jesus. I don't like your Christians. He struggled to believe in Christ because of the people. And listen, and I need to say this, and I think this is probably a good point. I love the church. The church is the bride of Christ. And I would never talk about a past church or past people or shame or anything like that. But I do want to balance that grace with the reality that people have been hurt, that we're not perfect. We, we, we make mistakes. I, I love how when Paul in every letter is like, I love you. You're amazing. But also, you're, you're really messing up, but I love you. You're doing a good job. You're, but really, seriously, you got to stop doing that stuff. And he's like, it's this back and forth. And he brings up like, yes, through grace, you have been saved. But does that mean you can't, like holiness doesn't matter? No, I don't. That's not what matters. Like, it's this, he's trying to say, holiness matters, but you're going to mess up and you need grace. Righteousness matters, but you're going to mess up, and so is your neighbor, and they need grace. For some people, they can't get past the imperfection in their own lives, so they don't glow up. But for others, they can't get past the imperfection in their neighbor in the church. So the glow up stops. If you're a new believer online or in the house, I'm kind of jealous. There's just that innocence, man. Come on, like, I just love seeing it. Like, youth groups are the best. Like, youth groups, like, I could preach, send me to preach to a youth group. Like, that'd be easier than adults. Um, Kids, we love to serve in kids' church because they just believe, they don't have any pain or trauma. It's amazing. But I'm begging you to hear me because I think this is the kind of message that will save your faith if you hear it in your soul before something happens. At this church or another church, 3,000 churches close every year. Um, And a massive percentage due to scandal. We don't like, we love to say the church has planted numbers. Love to talk about it. And that's good. We should talk about it. Paul tells us to talk about good things. But there's also things that it's like, what's happening? And I'm, and I'm curious, why does the church even fall apart after the scandal? Where are the, I love that we've anointed so many new pastors. That no matter what happens, there should be men and women ready to step up to lead in case something happens. This church will not fall because we have people who are passionate and who can step in. As a father, parents out there, I don't want to parent my kids in a way where they're so dependent on me for the rest of their life. The goal is to make a Christian out of you that is self-reliant on God, that can read the scripture for themselves, that can challenge it, that can preach the gospel, that can go on missions trips, that can go into prisons. Even now, man, I think like I'm preaching And I'm going to screw up. Like, what's hilarious to me is that, like, I get that fear, too. I I know that's got to be there of, like, I'm letting new people speak, and, like, they could say something wrong. But how in the world could we develop new preachers without letting them preach? Like, we're supposed to expand the kingdom. And so inevitably, you're going to have a preacher, oh, that one was messed up. I saw uh, on Instagram just the other day, there was a pastor who openly admitted, he said something along the lines that the day of Pentecost was the greatest moment in church history. And the next Sunday, he got up and the first thing he said was, what I said last week was wrong. The resurrection of Jesus was the greatest moment in church history. I think we have a church like that. 
We have a, he, Pastor admits he's imperfect all the time. It cracks me up. It doesn't matter how much training, study, seminary we attend. We're going to occasionally slip up. And you have grace for that. Or do you get, you get mad? You go, hmm. I'm not listening to the rest of the sermon. <laughs> I'm sitting in the back row next week. I'm going to write an email to the pastor. <laughs> you got to be planted somewhere to grow. And if, if imperfection and leadership or pastors are things, let the little things go. Forgive. Forgive. And at the end of the day, I can promise you this. Just plant somewhere. And if it's not here, oh, we just want to see you know Jesus. There are life-giving churches all over the city. We're going to be one of them. And we want you here. Of course we want you here. We want to grow. We're going to two services. I love it. But we just want to see you know Jesus. But remember, that next church you go to is not perfect either. You ever heard of church hopping? It is a thing, man. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says... For the time is coming will people not, will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, for they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. myths. I don't even have to preach, man. That, that'll preach. Maybe occasionally, too. This is a big part of being planted. To grow. You want to glow up? Maybe the thing that offends you that makes you want to leave the church is truth. Maybe the pastor wasn't wrong when he said that thing that frustrated you, angered you, hit something inside of you. You can't church hop, not forever. It's all right to look around for a little bit to be like, oh, you know, I like this music. I like these people. I like, you know, but eventually you got to pick a place and root in. So when that storm comes, you have Jesus and community. That's the cross. You have to have both. You are not alone in your frustration at the church being imperfect either. If you look at Jesus, who was Jesus mad at? Like, yes, the woman, I think of the woman at the well. He did preach truth to her. He did say, go and sin no more. But for the most part, that was all he said to her about righteousness. The rest of the message was grace through him, was forgiveness through him, that he would give her living water. Is that how you preach? I, yes, grace and truth. But you've got to have grace. Look at Paul. Paul, I, again, I, I mentioned him. Every letter to Corinth, Ephesus, Thessalonica, Galatia, who Michelle mentioned, she loves Galatians. He was frustrated. <laughs> Every time he was like, I heard about what y'all been doing. <laughs> and I have some notes. <laughs> there were, he was frustrated. And not just the leadership, too. He was frustrated. But he wasn't trying to tear it down. He wanted to be a part of the church so that he could build it up. Tear down some walls, some things that, oh, I don't, this structure's not good. No, that you shouldn't be having a relationship with your own family. Nope, you shouldn't be doing this stuff. But Christ is the foundation, is what you build upon. He loved the church and was so desperate for them to stop their foolishness. Then they gave their lives to it. There was no option at the time of finding another church. Like today we have that, but are you doing it to suit your own passions and desires and the things that you just want a yes man preacher? You just want a yes man small group leader? Someone to tell you, yeah, it's all right, you can keep doing that, that's fine. Or do you actually want God's word? Because God's word is, man, it's going to convict you, it's going to challenge you, it's gonna, but it's going to build you. That's the only, I have never been to the gym, walked in and been like, all right, I'm here. I'm stronger and walk back out. <laughs> like, you got to do the work. 
my son, I, I, I love kids, man. They, they want to play sports, and they want to play, I'm going to do one season of basketball, and then I'm going to switch next season, I'm going to do soccer, and then I'm going to play, and I'm like, okay, but just so you know, this is finding what you like, but you're not going to get that much better if you just keep jumping around. <laughs> like, you got to dig in, plant roots, and glow up. So what's your commitment level? Do you have a knee-jerk reaction to ministry? Where you're like, oh, I didn't like what he said, I'm out. Or are you going to dig in? The, museum, the church is not a museum for perfect people. It is a hospital for the sick and the broken. We say this all the time. We say this phrase, that we have hope for a broken humanity. And then humanity comes in the door and we're like, why are you broken? I don't like that. I don't like it. Why are you surprised? And then they receive Jesus and you're like, six months past, you're like, you still broken? Yes. There's two terms and this is kind of the theology coming in. There's regeneration and there's sanctification. Regeneration is what the Holy Spirit does in you when you receive Jesus. It is the life change inside you. Sanctification is the year-long process, years of becoming more and more like Christ towards perfection. You have regeneration in you. That's the thing that starts the glow up. That's the seed. But sanctification, that becoming more like Jesus takes time. So when you look at your neighbor next to you who's still struggling with addiction, what's your heart for them? Do you judge them? God judged Jesus on the cross. Do not look at your fellow brother or sister in Christ and judge them. You can make judgment calls. You can say, you can say, hey, I see something in you. I love you. But don't judge their salvation. Don't judge their heart. That's God's. That belongs to God. Romans 7, 18 through 19. And again, this is Paul who said, for I know nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. This was an apostle, not just like a leader, not just me or Pat. This was an apostle of Jesus Christ who constantly said he kept messing up. But then we're like, oh man, disqualify the pastor. He said something, he said one thing wrong. Oh man, he had a sabbatical and now he's back and preaching again. God called David, man. God called Saul and nothing they did could remove that anointing. I love this story. I saw recently um, on a podcast. It was about a man who was in relationship with his pastor. And it was a New Beginnings ministry. He came to the pastor and he said, I slipped up, I relapsed. I fell back into the drugs I was doing. And he was ashamed and he confessed. The pastor said, come on, let's go. And he, they, they walked out and he took him out and they went and they celebrated. That sounds weird. Two reasons why the pastor said he celebrated. One, he said that the man for the first time felt conviction by the Holy Spirit and he turned to God instead of running from him. And two, it was the longest he had ever been without relapsing. He had made it six months when he couldn't make it a week before. There was growth. He had planted roots in a church and was growing. But if that happens to your neighbor or that happens to the person you see in the church or someone in your small group that you thought was faithful and maybe they don't love Jesus if they're going to go back to that. No, they do love Jesus. They're being sanctified. You're being sanctified. You're being changed. John 13, 35, by this all people will know you're my disciples if you love one another. It doesn't say that they're going to know you by being perfect. It says they're going to know you by love. Do you love the hurting, the broken, the sinner, the way Jesus did. Jesus loved hurting people. How do you feel about the people in your life who are deconstructing? 
who are drifting away from faith? Do you judge them? Do you have disdain? Or do you have grief? Do you feel for them, yearn for them, pray for them, want more for them? Scripture doesn't say that we're gonna be known by our perfection. It's our love. And love is super easy when we're perfect. Super easy. Matthew 16, 14 through 15 says, for if you give others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. I don't like this next verse. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive yours. We forgive because we're forgiven, guys. The old things have passed away. The bitterness, the anger and resentment, the glow up in your spirit is what's new. It's your mind. It's, it's not that you are perfect. It's that when you sin, you feel conviction and you, you want to be perfect. Your heart is the thing that's been changed. You want to please God. And even though you don't always do it, God is still proud of you. And he sees Jesus when you mess up. You're covered. Sometimes I love the analogy of grace is an umbrella to shield you from the storm. It's not a diaper to do whatever you want. Righteousness does matter. I'm not, please hear me when I say that. Righteousness matters. And forgiving someone else, if you need to forgive someone, know that it doesn't minimize your pain. I think sometimes we're like, I can't forgive them. I'm still angry at them. I go, I know. You can forgive the Christians and the people in your life. It doesn't make what they did okay. Forgive and forget is this term. I don't think you have to forget. You can set up new boundaries with people. You can be like, I'm gonna forgive you, but we're gonna, we're gonna set up some new boundaries, some healthy boundaries. Being re in relationship with the church body is a commandment. It's not an option, guys. Philippians 2, 1 through 4 says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. I don't know of a significant relationship that doesn't have fights. Married people, you already know that's true. My favorite though, my favorite human relationship is brothers. I, I don't have a brother, but every time I see like grown brothers, I'm like, those dudes could fight it out right now. But if someone else steps in, man, they have each other's backs. I feel like sisters have that too, but it's kind of different. So how do we balance it? How do we balance having grace, but also pursuing Christ and having perfection? And this is my last point of the day. I know I'm running a bit long, but do you hear my heart, church? I really think this will, that will help you when something happens, because I'm not, I'm not even prophesying. I'm just, but things happen, man. People fail and people are gonna fail you. But sometimes the church lets you down but that doesn't mean that God ever does. I loved the tag at the end of that last song, man. Great is your faithfulness, God. The church is imperfect. The people in it continue to be flawed. They have pain points. They have things going on. We all come from a history that we're all dealing with. We probably all need therapy and counseling. But God, you're so good. Maybe you struggle with that goodness this morning of saying like, I don't get how God can be faithful. There have been things in my life that have not felt like God was faithful. But I have found in my life, the old age of 33, she, pastor joked around, better hope it's not your last year. That was Jesus's. If it is, I'm coming up, Jesus. Um, but God is faithful when you look back. It's in the storm that it's hard to see. He is faithful. 
He will be there for you. He doesn't promise to solve all your issues. Deuteronomy 31, 6 said, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not, be, do not fear or be dismayed. Matthew 6, 26 says, look at the birds of the air. Neither they sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they are? Do you know the big reason why you won't be forsaken? Because Jesus was. He looked at the Father in his last moment, dying on the cross, and he said, God, why have you forsaken me? You know what the answer to that question was? It was you. It was you and you and you and you and you. Jesus died because he loves you. Because he wanted you to be forgiven. The church is the bride of Christ. We are called to be committed to it, to have grace for each other. We say we're family. Be family. That means helping with the dishes. That means next week when we have two services, maybe say, hey, can I help for one of the services? Can I help with something? Can I chip in? Forgive each other. Stick together like family's blood. Stick together. Each one of us fails. None are righteous. No, not even one. You need to start building a relationship with the people standing next to you. And this is where I transition to, I am the anchor groups pastor. And y'all got to get in a group. You cannot have a relationship and live as a family if you're just seeing each other once a week now and then. You've got to get in a group of people. Mine is at 5 p.m. today. I live right by Dutchtown High School. If all you want to come, just please RSVP. Uh, <laughs> but I'll do it, man. Well, my wife, she will cook up something. She'll be stressed doing it, but she'll do it. Fill out that Connect card, person listening online. We don't know who you are if you stay quiet. We can't build a relationship with you. And I promise you, we'll forgive you. We'll have grace for you. We'll be patient with you. We'll see, we wanna see you grow and have a relationship with the Father. And so right now, if everyone would close their eyes, if, if you don't know Jesus much, and again, I'm jealous of you. I'm so excited for you. If you're right there, if you're right there and you're willing to give God a chance, maybe you're not even ready to accept Jesus. You're just ready to give God a chance that if he would speak, okay, I'll listen. Okay, I'll listen. Just raise your hand in your seat. Press that button online. Just raise it and say, I'm ready, God. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm not perfect. And hopefully it gives you hope knowing that we're not perfect either. And if you are that, that believer who's, maybe you're coming back to church, I'm hoping for revival in your life. I'm praying for revival in your life, that you'd find a church and you'd bury deep roots. But if you're saying, I need that glow up too. I need that new life in Christ because I've been gone for a little while. Lift up your hand, no one looking. It's between you and God. So this morning, I ask, forgive the church of your past if you have some pain. You might have some pain from that past. It doesn't mean you forget. And be ready and prepared that this church isn't perfect either but it's a relationship, it's a courtship. I have to forgive my wife every day. Though she doesn't do anything wrong, so I don't know why. Jesus, Father, God, I pray. Oh God, I just pray over the church right now, Father. Right here in the church that's wandering, the lost sheep, Father, that don't have a home, that don't have roots, that don't have a place, that struggle with a thing in their past that maybe they did or someone did to them. I pray for that person who would have grace for themselves and grace for their past too. That forgiveness would overflow because they know they've been forgiven. 
I pray that you would work powerfully in the life of the church and the believers. I pray that you would just pour out humility on us in the leadership of this church. Father, I pray over Pastor Pitts. I pray over every pastor that's been anointed recently that they would be able to walk fully and confidently in the calling that they've been given, even though they know that they don't have it together either. And that together we would follow Jesus. We would listen and obey and give everything we have to the church that Jesus gave everything he had. It's in all these things we pray. Amen. 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 Let's give it up for God this morning. Thank you for joining us for this message. If you'd like to learn more about Anchor Chapel or support our ministries, you can visit anchorchapel.com or follow us on social media at Anchor Chapel. Have a great week.